Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson from The Secret History, Living Inside Your Aquarium. Today, we're going to be taking a look at my aquarium, but that's just for something to look at because I don't have anything to show you really of what we're going to be talking about, which is the history of the very first fish. So, this subject is always changing. I want you to know that. We're always learning things. And let me just lay down the the background, the the bedrock, the foundation of this story. And you guys can just enjoy my fish just swimming around and maybe think about evolution in their bodies and how they act and if they say something or mention body parts as they evolve, things like that. Maybe you can see some of these characteristics in some of these fish in the tank. I don't know. So, let's start at the very beginning. So, the, the Burgess Shale is a deposit in Canada that runs all the way down through uh, the northern uh, Great Plains. Uh, and there is a big old deposit it starts up in Alberta and goes through the Great Plains and there's a big old deposit of this loose rock type stuff that has these big outcroppings with incredible fossils from all over time and from several spots in the world actually and you may wonder, well, how does that happen? And that's because of continental drift and uprising and uh, tearing apart. But basically that area has been pushed up and it has become a segment turned sideways of all these years uh, as the continents lift up into each other. You could see all the things going on in the water in freshwater lakes and in oceans, depending on the time period, all the way back to uh, just after the breakup of the, the giant continent that you may have heard of called Gondwana. So we're talking 518 million years ago as of now, uh, give or take a day or two. So back then, 518 million years ago, the first fish... Uh, was discovered, this is what we know now. So the old story used to go that fish, uh, they found some species and they thought, oh, these are the first fish, That this is for sure. And it turned out that they didn't really meet the definition of fish by scientific, uh, current scientific terms. And so when they found this sort of missing link in 1993... Uh, named the Metasprigna walcotti, they uh, they decided that, oh no, this is the first fish. So don't be surprised if in another five years someone says, no, this is the real first fish. But we're talking somewhere around 500 million years ago. So 500 million years ago, <clears throat> they find this first fish fossil. They happen to luck out so well, so there's deposits of this fish in Australia, in China, and on in the Burgess Shale, in Canada and, Amer and the United States of America. And they happen to find such well-preserved uh, finds of this fish that they actually have cartilage, and they can see the soft tissue of this fish, they can see this thing that they, it's debatable, is it a spinal cord? Because fish are vertebrates, right? That means they, they have a spinal cord and they have uh, bones or at least cartilage coming off of that. And then they have some sort of, you know, skull or uh, bony uh, head type thing. So, and I know that that sounds like I'm being vague, and I am, because bony head type thing is about as close as we can get to what we would call um, some of these fish. Now, I'm kind of showing you guys my uh, catfish on purpose because now we think of these as bony type fish uh, and this was a whole different type of animal that is gone now. It's not, it's not like our bony catfish today or armored catfish today. It's a whole other level. So 
This fish that lived 500 million years ago it was about six centimeters long, and it had, uh, you know, organs that were visible. The lungs and and the liver and everything showed up in that, along with this proto spine and skull type thing. And it did not have a jaw. It looked something like a lamprey. You know what it really looked like was a. Uh, kind of like a worm it looked a little bit like a worm with eyes in the front and it didn't have a jaw but it had kind of a sucker mouth and uh it had seven gills and that's key so they find that and uh before that they found uh members of a family called the the craniates but they that cra- you know coming from the word cranium and they had bony heads, but no actual spine uh, down their center, internal uh, structures for bones. Uh, they're softer, or they were, you know, invertebrates, like uh, like mollusks and, and uh, things like that. So, we get through this first part, and by 450 million years ago, uh, there's another fish called the Aranthopsis. And this guy kind of looks like uh, a modern day puffer fish, actually. Uh, pretty similar to, looks looks kind of like a little pea puffer. And this fish looks like that because over time it has evolved. And from 520 million years ago to 450 million years ago, fish started making a transition. And that's because all the continents had once been this land mass called Gondwana that you may have heard of uh, back in school or since then. But it was when all the continents... There's a puffer while I'm talking about it. Uh, but while all the, the continents were together, it had that name. And then soon it split up again and there were all these continents and then they came together once again. And this is three major land masses that came together, and this was then known uh, as the Adiopsis Sea, um, or A- Adiopsis, I don't know how to say it exactly, Adiopsis or Adiopsis. Uh, it's, it's pronounced two ways, depending on, like, a German professor will say it one way, and, you know, an Australian will say it another way, but... Uh, in the videos and things that I've watched and books I've read, um, I'm going to say Adiopsis. So this Adiopsis Sea is is basically still a, a, a saline sea. It's got all the kind of ocean-type things going on with tides and vents and things like that. And it has rough water because it's a big open area. Well, as the continents close in after breaking up, they close back in on each other and they form one body of water in particular that was like an ocean that had three continents coming in and it was kind of a triangle shaped uh, ocean in the center. <clears throat> and that ocean got smaller and smaller and smaller and shallower and more shallow and all of a sudden the the body of water's gone mountains have risen up and this has turned into lakes and rivers the water that was displaced all draining back down to the center now why is it important to understand what uh, continents form and continental drift and all this sort of thing well if you haven't brushed up on it you should i could talk about that in another video but it feels so far off track from fish that I'm going to request that if you don't know what continental uh, drift is and the idea of uh, subduction zones and fault lines and things like that, go ahead and Google that and learn how that works. Because what that does is that forms the first mountains uh, during the time when fish are ready to take over their habitat in the wild. So it forms these massive mountains predicted to be possibly as tall as Mount Everest and running a long way. And this, these mountains are known today as the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, and today, those ran across one side, and then the other mountains that ran across the other side 
were uh, were the Caledonian Mountains. And the Caledonian Mountains are the ones we're going to talk about here, even though the other ones get more... They are more known, possibly, because, well, there's a bunch of Roman history and stuff like that <laughs> that has to do with it not having to do with uh, geography or anything. So, Caledonian Mountain Fossils... That's where we start to see uh, fish and things that have two distinct body styles. And that is the placoderm, which is like the armored sharks or spiny sharks. And then the uh, eusinopterus, which are lobed fin. And they are the ones that we are related to, actually. Uh, they don't really... Uh, they don't ro reign supreme... Uh, any anymore or very long in the water because they soon uh, started walking on their fins. You can actually kind of see similar evolution in things like mud skippers uh, and a few newts and things like that. These are the guys who start colonizing land. And what's important, what happens at the same exact time as all this going on is that there are the 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 uh the land is like a desert this continent that forms there's just there's no plants that we that we think of like you'd think that there was a jungle or a rainforest no there's just a 110 degree uh desert basically and in spots there were moss and ferns and things like that in the cracks and in the shade but there wasn't really uh there weren't forests as we know it up until the Devonian period. And so this is when we move away from, you know, small palm tree type looking things, uh, large mushrooms and insects and things like that because the oxygen was higher in, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere back then. And uh, this Devonian period, 70% of life was made up by these placoderms, which were armored sharks. They had heads that were made up of this bony material. Um, I guess you could call it the same as bone today, but it was slightly different and they actually died out. <clears throat> but they had a vertebrae and a head with a jaw, and this was a major, major advantage. This drove all the other fish... All the other eusinopterus and all the little uh, critters out there to start to diversify. And they have this giant predator. And for a long time, and we still don't know for sure, but my personal thought is that, you know, we thought we had this fish the, with a hardened skull and this jaw that is razor blade sharp that works like scissors. And these things got up to several feet long, several meters long even in some cases later. And they would eat things and just cut them in half and swallow, cut it in half, swallow. You know, not, not chewing teeth or anything. This is the jaw is the teeth. There are no scales yet. It's just this bony-headed shark thing. <clears throat> and if you want to look at some fish that look similar to the fish that it was eating... Look up a coelacanth. It's a whole other thing that I'll do another uh, video on, but it was a, 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 a type of fish they believed to be extinct for like a billion years, and I'm not kidding, and it turned out it was alive in the oceans. So, these other fish, they think that they only made up 20 to 30% of, of the fish populations, the biomass back then. Uh, not the bony-headed ones, but the other ones, the, the ones with jaws and the little ones that look like lampreys that don't have jaws but just have two eyes, the one they found the fossil of. Well, those little guys they found the fossil of that look like worms have now evolved into things that we know today, such as like hagfish or eels, similar things to that, uh, lampreys. Eels are a little more evolved than they came off a slightly different branch because they have jaws. But when they don't have jaws, they are, you know, like lampreys. They've got this sucker mouth with a round mouth with teeth in it. Uh, that is an earlier form of the, 
one of the evolutionary uh, body types that they tried that's still with us. That's kind of cool. But they said that 70% of these fish are the bony-headed ones that went extinct, that were the big predators. However, they're the ones with the bone. The other ones have cartilage, and it's really hard to find fossils of cartilage. So I don't think that they honestly know how many uh, eusinopterus versus placoderms there were in the water. Uh, We know a lot about placoderms because we find their bony heads, and they're the ones that are in museums. Uh, But we don't know a whole lot about the eusinopterus. So we're going to have to find more of those cartilage fossils with soft tissue that are just once in a lifetime scores. You know, we've only been digging for these fossils for give or take 250 years. And, uh, you know, it's it, nobody should expect that we've found all the, the steps in the ladder of, of uh, evolution of fish <laughs> by this point. So, after this period, the land is, as I said, is kind of like a desert with kind of like cactus things and ferns and moss and lichen and hot. Well, those mountains cause uh, clouds to form. So the hot weather evaporates uh, water from the oceans, which turns into clouds, goes to those mountains that are as tall as Mount Everest, and all of a sudden... It starts to rain in these rivers, these massive rivers form in these ancient uh, continents. And so these ancient rivers are where all the lobed fish really find their way in the world and in evolution. And they evolve out to become, uh, to become you know, things like newts and, uh, and uh, snakes, amphibians... Uh, small animals like mammals and uh, these little uh, scurrying lizard type things, you know, all different, all different types of early land animals that were invertebrates. So, and then later some things go back into the ocean and then they come out and then they go back in. If you're looking at like whales, it's pretty incredible uh, how evolution has worked in some cases. But uh, if you look at, in Red Hill, Pennsylvania, you can see the first trees, and these are the trees that gave shade to those rivers that were f- that were in the foothills of that barren landscape. And uh, this this is about 370 years ago, as this is all going on, and all these different types of fish, these three types, the the ones that don't have a, a jaw but they're um, swimming around eating things like lampreys or eating things off the floor and vegetation. Then the the lobed fin fish, and then there's the, the cartilage, cartilageous fish, and then there are the, uh, the bony head fish that all of a sudden kind of just die out. Most of them die out. But in 370 million BC, <laughs> these first uh, trees appear that are like, up to 60 or 70 feet tall, and they're called Archaeopteris. And that may sound familiar, but it's spelled differently than the the dinosaur. But these Archaeopteris are these nice trees with these big kind of oak leaf uh, oak leaves that actually end up falling into the water. They're they're kind of like a mix between a pine tree and an oak tree. I know that's confusing, but they've got mid sized leaves that are broad enough to shield out the sun. They f- the leaves fall, and so we don't know if they were deciduous or coniferous or what the deal was, but they did fall into the river as the tree aged and grew, and as the tree died, it would fall over and create log habitats, log, and uh, the fish would live in there. And all this while, you know, different algae and different invertebrates and little creatures to eat started appearing and insects started appearing uh in different new forms that were smaller and easier for the the fish to eat this also puts carbon and nitrates in the water and uh, you can imagine on this early continent that it's almost like a mangrove uh forest in these lakes and rivers in the shallows where most of these fish are dwelling now that's the guess we have now. It could always change. From here, uh, we know that 
the fish mostly came to the top of the water, and unless they were very small, they hung out in the shade because high uh, hot water does not carry high levels of oxygen. So then this type of fish started to evolve like the lungfish. The modern lungfish is a very ancient type of evolution, and they're freaky looking. Uh, you can see them on Aquarium Co-op, went over to Dean uh, Tweedle's house, uh, and you can check out his lungfish on Aquarium Co-op's channel. Uh, if you Google lungfish, I'm sure you'll find it. But <clears throat> that also broke off into lobed fish uh, together, and left the water and that's somewhere where we evolved from whereas the rest the lungfish actually a lot of them stayed in the water and they needed to breathe air but as the the earth changed and as the atmosphere changed those fish some of them evolved gills and before that gills were around in the small fish but as they got bigger they kind of weren't as necessary or they only worked in times and I'm talking millions of years here because we're talking all the way back to 520 million years and now we're up at 350 million years ago. So a 200 million year period, oxygen waned and got higher and lower in the atmosphere and in the oceans as well as things like eutrophication of uh, bacteria and things in the ocean. So fish develop these features that become kind of dormant in their evolution like gills or the ability to breathe out of water like mud skippers can do also <clears throat> and the the gills and things like that you just saw a nice gill flare on that the angelfish and it's just a very interesting time and this is when we start to see a ton of species of fish start to explode. And this is about where I'm going to end this story today. Uh, this is where you see the lungfish, those lungs that they have, evolve into air bladders in modern day fish. Some of them keep them, some of them evolve labyrinth organs like bettas and uh, garamis have. Uh, they can gulp air and things like that, while others ditch them completely. If you want to know more about this story... Let me know. Let me know what your favorite early fish is if you're into this. Or what you think is the oldest fish relative out there currently. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this little story. We'll pick it up next time when the fish start to diversify. They live underwater uh, comfortably, being able to breathe. They have swim bladders. And it's not just competition between only two types. Now we've got sharks. Now we've got uh, little fish. We've got freshwater, saltwater. There's all these different uh, environments starting to specialize and, and trees and things colonizing the world. So get ready to join us next time and leave a thumbs up, subscribe. And if you're feeling really frisky, fishy, and wild, uh, check out my Patreon link below, and that is greatly supported. Maybe I can uh, hire someone to do some visuals, or, you know, like go back in time and get the fish and, and show you. I hope to be going to museums soon and uh, maybe getting some samples, uh, photos and things of these fish since I live in a town with a good museum in Seattle. So, all right, guys, I will talk to you next time. I hope you enjoyed that little story time. It wasn't too confusing. There's like four different lines to the story that all intersect and run at the same time. And I could talk to you for hours about the things going on at the same time as that. But for now, we'll leave it all there. And uh, I'll talk to you next time. Take it easy, guys. Take care of yourselves, your tanks. And I'll talk to you later.